Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Donald Bradley. I'm the Vice President for Research here at KAUST. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker at WEP, so Professor Rifat Atun. So Rifat, uh, since 2013, has been Professor of Global Health Systems at the Departments of Global Health and Population and Health Policy and Management at Harvard University. He's also the Faculty Chair of the Harvard Ministerial Leadership Program. Prior to joining Harvard, he spent seven years at Imperial College in London, working as the Professor of International Health Management and Head of the Health Management Group. And during that time, he was also a member of the Executive Management Team and Director of the Strategy, Performance and Evaluation Cluster of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria. And he was responsible for chairing the panel that oversaw investments of $4 billion per year across a hundred and more countries. Professor Atun studied medicine at the University of London as a Commonwealth Scholar, where he also completed his postgraduate medical studies. He then also did an MBA at Imperial College in London. His research has two major strands, so health system performance and the impact of design and implementation on reforms, uh, of reforms on outcomes, and secondly, the adoption and diffusion of innovation in health systems, so including healthcare technologies, disease control programs and primary healthcare reforms, and innovative financing in global health. He's widely published, so he has more than 350 papers, highly cited, uh, H-index, I know some people don't like it, but an H-index of 68 with 20,000 citations, and he's led or been a commissioner in 10 Lancet commissions. He's a fellow of the Royal College of General Practitioners in the UK, a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health of the Royal College of Physicians in the UK, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in the UK. He's worked with more than 30 global governments and the World Bank, World Health Organization and the UK Department for International Development to help design, implement and evaluate health system reforms, uh, often leading to major new initiatives. He was the founding director of the MSc in International Health Management the BSc in Management and Medical Science, and the co-founding co-director of the Masters in Public Health programs at Imperial College. So not only is he uh, a very well-known uh, uh, researcher and uh, government uh, advisor, but he's also very strongly interested in education. He's led executive education programs and undertaken assignments with a number of major companies, including Novartis, Medtronic, GSK, Pfizer, Vodafone, Hoffman La Roche, and Tata Consulting. He's also been a founding director and investor in a number of spin-out companies from Imperial College, which operate in the areas of health information systems and biotechnology. He's also a member of the UK Longitude Prize Committee, which is an eight million pound grand challenge prize addressing antimicrobial resistance. And finally, if that's not enough, uh, he's very closely engaged at the moment with the G20 Health Working Group under the Saudi Arabi Arabian Presidency and on Friday was participating in G20 meetings. Um, it's my great pleasure to ask uh, Rifat to present his talk, Precision Medicine Opportunities and Challenges. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Donald. It's uh, really great to see you again. Uh, and big thanks to Kaust as well as to Donald for inviting me to give a keynote at uh, the Winter Enrichment Program at Kaust. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be here. What I'm going to share with you over the next 45 minutes or so is um, it's really a journey on precision medicine, looking at opportunities and the challenges and how precision medicine is evolving and what the uh, societal uh, impact could be of the, the current innovations that are happening in precision medicine. So I'll focus on precision medicine, but also on precision health. Then look at the promise of precision medicine and health, look at some of the emerging innovations with some case studies, uh, but then look at the challenge, the challenge of innovation in health systems, and then think through how we can overcome this challenge by creating an ecosystem for precision medicine and health, and innovation in general, so that these innovations lead to 
uh, adoption and scale up in systems to have impact at population and societal level. So what is precision medicine? Well, it's a new approach uh, for disease prevention, promotion, and treatment. Although initially it focused on treatment, it has since uh, widened. Essentially, it considers individual variability in uh, genetic makeup, so genotype, but also health status, lifestyles, sociocultural or socioeconomic characteristics, as well as interactions with the environment that collectively shape the phenotype. So both on genotype as well as factors influencing the phenotype. And then the approach uses biomarkers and other diagnostic uh, tools uh, in screening, diagnosis, treatment, and post-treatment, uh, monitoring to look at the impact and the variation in impact in relation to the response of, of an individual to the interventions that have been presented, in this case, treatment. So you can see uh, various factors impacting on an individual. And precision health uh, is really a derivative of, of this and applies the same principles, but to populations, to population groups, or to individuals within a population. And I think this is where the really exciting developments are going to come in the near future and where U.S. cows could, could contribute. So what is the promise of uh, precision medicine? Um, essentially, what precision medicine does is it takes interventions that have been, uh, that is a one-size-fits-all and apply to a general population to a, a heterogeneous group, to subgroups to have better outcomes. So as we can see, the traditional approach uh, has a one-size-fits-all approach, although for some groups, subgroups, the treatment or intervention is effective and safe, for others, it may be safe but not effective. But in others, it may be effective but with side events, adverse events. But in a subgroup, it's not effective but also has adverse events. And actually, generally in health, um, safety is a great issue. Around one third of interventions we do actually do not have an evidence base and, and many harm patients, leading to literally hundreds of thousands of deaths each year around the world with huge health and economic consequence. But with precision medicine, one is able to more precisely identify the genotype and the phenotype characteristics and uh, have targeted interventions, hence the term precision medicine, um, to have the correct treatment uh, that benefit all, not just a subgroup. So how does this work in practice? So in practice, precision medicine, as it's applied, has used uh, individual uh, single gene mutations or genetic drivers in a subset of patients, and these groups tend to be uh, small groups, then use biomarkers and multiple molecular diagnostic tests to identify those with the genetic mutation, and then provide uh, at molecular level targeted therapies uh, for these patients that have the genetic mutations. So the way we've transitioned to transition medicines from population level one size fits all, fit, fits all approach, such as use of antibiotics or vaccines, to uh, treatments or interventions for subgroups, for example, targeted therapies using monoclonal antibodies, and now to individuals, highly individualized uh, interventions, for example, using immunotherapy or using gene replacement therapy uh, that is designed for each patient. So this is as precise as one could get, uh, going down to gene level at, at an individual level. And the benefits of precision medicine are uh, apparent and, and large at, at individual level and for the subgroups concerned. It leads to improved clinical effectiveness because we're applying the correct treatment to an individual who's likely to benefit. We have improvements in efficiency of care because uh, we are not wasting tests and also applying resources to individuals who are not going to benefit or uh, adverse events are reduced. And it also increases patient responsiveness to outcomes. So outcomes in relation to improved health, but also collectively 
improvements in relation to uh, economic benefits for the individuals and the society as a whole. Now, this, the same principles can be applied to what we call precision health at population level. So one can uh, move from interventions targeting the population as a whole to interventions targeting at policy level or program level or intervention level to subgroups or individuals within that population. And I'll give you some examples of how this can be done uh, with illustrative examples. So this is an area that I've been doing some work on. Um, so for example, this is a study we published in TLOS Medicine uh, at the end of 2018 using uh, national, national representative survey data, national representative both at state level as well as district level, looking at, uh, again, looking at cardiometabolic disease, using um, uh, an individual level survey with individual level data and biomarkers. So it's, this is quite precise. And the data set is more than a million people. So it's a very large data set. And here we looked at what is the distribution of body mass index, obesity level, uh, high blood glucose levels, uh, mean systolic blood pressure, as well as smoking prevalence. All of them risks for cardiovascular disease. And one can see here that uh, these are different states. We had data for all the states except for uh, Jammu and Kashmir and uh, Gujarat. Um, you can see there's an interesting gradient from uh, from south to north and from west to east. And this is for, for both females and males for body mass index, uh, high glucose prever prevalence, uh, mean systolic blood pressure, but less obvious perhaps for smoking prevalence. We can see far lower levels in women, for example, compared to, compared to male, and the gradients are not that strong. But interestingly, in the north, we have some hotspots. But what's interesting for me as a, as a health systems person is that this, this, in a country like India, looking at India as a whole is problematic because it's so diverse, so rich in terms of cultures and, and peoples. Um, and each state is also very different in terms of its characteristics, as is the health system. But what's very interesting here is that Kerala, here, has long been identified as a high-performing health system. In fact, several publications uh, called Good Health at Low Cost have identified Kerala as one of the high performers in the world. But actually, but the metrics they use related to under five mortality, infant mortality, and, uh, and maternal mortality ratio. And Kerala has done great uh, improvements in relation to those. But actually using uh, more uh, current concerns for India, for example, diabetes and hypertension, chronic di diseases that come with uh, demographic and epidemiological transition, Kerala is really underperforming. So here we have a system that has been high performing uh, and is identified as such, but actually when we use different metrics, we see that it's really an underperformer. So this is very important intelligence for policymakers. But we can take this a stage further by actually um, looking at uh, combining all of these to look at cardiovascular risk at state level or down to district level or even to subgroups. So when we combine these factors that influence cardiovascular risk, we can see again um, a, a, a trend but it's slightly different to the earlier trend and very a fairly big difference between male and female population. So this is a 10-year uh, age of standardized mean cardiovascular risk. So this enables policymakers then to develop policies to hotspots, to states. But all of you or any of you who's been to India and knows India well that the states are also very large. So we need to move to a next level of granularity if we're going to have greater precision with our interventions. So using this data that's representative at district level, we can actually um, look at rural and urban differences, uh, urban differences. And here we see uh, similar uh, 
findings, but in urban areas, in, in urban areas we see different hotspots compared to rural areas. So that gives another level of granularity. Next, we can move to actually district level. And we can combine cardiovascular risk, uh, both with rural and urban as a, as a, a geographic variation, but also we can look at uh, income of districts using wealth quintiles. And here, each point is a district in different parts of the country. And we can see a very interesting gradient. And in terms of wealth quintiles, one is the poorest, five is the richest. This is the population is divided into five quintiles, five subgroups by, uh, by income. And we see a, a clear gradient from the poorest to the richest, both in rural and urban areas. But we see huge variation uh, in all of these groups. And we can identify, again, uh, for each group where the outliers are. For example, um, here we see a couple of districts in the central area that are very high risk, and one in the northeast. And we can see here in the, uh, in, in the northeast many districts that should be targeted. So that gives us uh, greater granularity. But what's very interesting about this finding is that uh, cardiovascular disease was, when I was, certainly when I was at medical school, it was taught to me as being the disease of the rich. But actually, um, um, what happened over time is that in many countries that have overgone transition, it's actually now a disease of the poor. So we see higher prevalence of cardiovascular disease in poorer populations, certainly in high-income countries. But what we see in India is what I was taught at medical school some 30 years ago, or even longer, that we see that initially a cardiovascular disease risk is higher in higher income groups, lower in poorer groups. But what, what will happen in India if it follows the trajectory of other countries is that this gradient will shift from being like this to being like that. So and it will be a much sharper gradient. The levels of risk and outcomes in the richer populations will come down, and in poorer populations will relatively, and up in absolute terms, rise. So in India, we have an opportunity to intervene now to prevent this transition, to focus high-risk groups in a precise way to ensure that those individuals do not develop risk disease, and then adverse outcomes. We'll have a similar tra uh, transition in the kingdom, because we've seen this in many countries. I do this, I work in, in Latin American countries, Brazil, uh, et cetera, and we've seen these transitions. So there's an opportunity with Precision Health to identify trends uh, in a more precise way to, precise, uh, to develop more precise policy interventions. But we can go at a level even more granular using the data set. So we can now look at both in rural and urban areas. We could also go down to state level and district level, and then look at subgroups by age and by income. Then we look at risk levels. And what's interesting here is that in rural areas, an individual um, uh, age in a male population age 30 to 34 has a risk of 10-year uh, crude mean cardiovascular risk uh, uh, of six. But in the richest group, age 70 to 74 year olds, this risk is tenfold different. And actually for women um, in urban areas, this risk level is 13 times different in the same country. So applying a general policy of health promotion and prevention would not make sense. So precision health is just like precision medicine. You can really identify individuals with interventions, both in terms of health promotion, disease prevention, but also treatment to ensure that we're able to target interventions effectively. Now, the difference between precision medicine that deals with a genetic mutation uh, where there may be 20 individuals with that mutation in a country, 
to uh, precision health in a country like India is that you're, one is dealing with um, 500 or 600 million, even more, eight, 900 million people. India's population is uh, 1.2 billion. Uh, and this population, this group is uh, around eight, 900 million people. So the impact can be huge on individuals, households, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the nation, the society as a whole, and, and the economy. And, and impact on s sustainable development goals. So what are the emerging innovations in relation to um, precision medicine and, uh, and precision health. So there are a number of um, successful examples emerging. For example, the most well-known perhaps and the most celebrated uh, one is trastuzumab, which is a, um, which is a monoclonal antibody, a, a targeted therapy uh, which is indicated for breast cancer, but those who are HER2 positive, so human epidermal growth factor receptor positive. Here, when trastumazab is applied to this population, group, subgroup, outcomes are uh, very good, but if it's applied to individuals that are negative, outcomes are very poor. So immediately, we can get good results by applying this intervention. If a, if a kaftor is another um, uh, interest, interesting uh, uh, su a successful example, which is a gene-based therapy for individuals that have cystic fibrosis due to a, a, a mutation. Um, and here, uh, the, the gene therapy allows these individuals to, to produce the, uh, the necessary, um, uh, necessary uh, secretions uh, or to reduce the secretions to, to reduce the side effects of cystic fibrosis. Glivec is another well-known example which is again a target, in this case, a targeted therapy, which is uh, used for, uh, which is used in chronic myelogenous leukemia, but also acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but those who are Philadelphia chromosome positive. Uh, Strimvelis is, uh, Strim is a very interesting example, and uh, used, this is an ex vivo stem cell gene therapy, um, and used in individuals with, uh, that are uh, due to genetic mutation, uh, there are deficient in adenosine deaminase that leads to reduced immunity and combined severe immune deficiency. And I'll briefly talk about how this is done. And a new development uh, that has completely uh, changed management of non Hodgkin lymphoma and refractory acute lymphoblastic leukemia in children, but also now being applied in adults, is uh, CAR T cells where uh, T lymphocytes are extracted from an individual and then modified to, uh, to develop uh, uh, antigens, then infused back into the body so they can actually fight, fight the tumor cells. And this is immunotherapy. So one can see different classes of interventions, both within the ambit of precision medicine that are being used and that are successful, and not just in cancer, but also beyond. So Stremvelis, how it works, is very interesting here. An individual uh, that, that has the, um, uh, the condition, the bone marrow is collected, uh, and then CD34 plus cells are then extracted. These are the stem cells that would actually lead to uh, T lymphocytes um, that, that are needed uh, for, um, uh, for appropriate response. Then the abnormal bone marrow is uh, treated to ensure that bone marrow is clear. And then the gene is, is, the gene, uh, is inserted into a viral vector, uh, in this case uh, an adenovirus, which itself is of course attenuated, so when it's infused into the, into the body, it doesn't have the, uh, the effects of the, the, the virus. And then the CD34 cells um, that have the um, uh, the modified genes are infused back into the bone marrow, and then these grow, and then grow into new lymphocytes that can actually then uh, that can uh, that can develop the immunity needed uh, to overcome the severe immune deficiency. So there are other examples coming through, uh, and one currently used 
Uh, interesting example is Loxterna gene therapy, a very expensive therapy used to treat blindness due to a mutation in a gene called R RP65. And here, actually, the, um, the, the, the gene is actually inserted into the eyeball to, to, um, uh, to have the uh, desired effect and to correct the, the mutation. And then there are anti-PD-1 and uh, anti-PD-1 antibodies that are used in targeted or as targeted or immunotherapy in malignant melanoma, which has been very difficult to treat with uh, very low levels of five-year net survival. Um, again, this is uh, used for uh, those individuals which have a mutation of the BRAF uh, uh, V600E a gene in, in, that is seen in 60% of melanomas. And we're also seeing um, immunotherapies being developed uh, for IDH1 and IDH2 inhibitors uh, for brain tumors, which again, in this case, gliomas, which, are, again, very diff which have been very, very difficult to treat with very low survival. So dramatic improvements with, with large increases in health outcomes in terms of survival in individuals that are able to benefit from these uh, interventions. So this precision medicine highly targeted at gene level. So precision health um, uh, is also benefiting from developments in other uh, sciences, not just in medicine, to better, after identifying subgroups, as I've illustrated to you, is to use interventions to develop individual interventions for health promotion, prevention, as well as treatment. For example, in precision health, we're now using uh, uh, learnings from behavioral economics, using nudge. Have you heard of nudge? Anyone in the audience? Yes, those of you who are taking economics or have done economics. It's very interesting. So you nudge somebody to do something. So, so here, one can use information to nudge, so to develop new habits, for example, changing the menus to have more salads and healthier foods, or having calorie counts. So one is nudged to think about what they're eating, or one can actually demonstrate benefits of certain uh, activities or lifestyles, or one can talk about the, um, or nudge individuals about the consequences, for example, smoking, using uh, warning uh, warnings on packaging or actually having fairly grotesque images of what happens when one smokes and one has side effects. Beyond information, one can also change what the default is. For example, uh, providing salads as, as the, the main meal as opposed to something that is fried or fatty. So if you go to, at my school, for example, uh, at Harvard, when one goes into the um, the restaurant, you see immediately lots of salads. And to get to the pizza, you really have to walk and, and find it at the end. So it really changes what the norm is. You can do the same for exercise. For example, rather than using lifts, using stairs. Or developing, changing the whole layout of a city to have bicycle lines. Where I live in Cambridge, many people cycle. Uh, I know this is also a very way of getting around in places like the Netherlands or in many of the Nordic countries, uh, Denmark, for example. So one can also um, use, generate new norms for populations or subgroups. For example, exercise in workplace or setting targets in the beginning of the year or even as part of one's annual review. Um, or nudging people to hand wash, having reminders at where, the, um, uh, where one has to do, do, do hand washing. So nudge has been extensively used uh, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve precision health by targeting individuals or subpopulation groups. Now, a really exciting development is uh, using uh, new developments in psychology or our understanding of psychology and, and combining this with science. I think some of the work that you're doing here, for example, in digital health, using theories of motivation and cognitive behavior, 
using chatbots. And chatbots have been used to, not, uh, to uh, change individual behavior in relation to lifestyle, but for smoke, also for smoking cessation. One can combine chatbot with machine learning and artificial intelligence so that the intervention becomes highly tailored over time as information is gathered on individual's behavior, but also responses to, to the information that individual has been given. Or one could take this even a stage further and develop conversational uh, artificial intelligence or conversational AI agents that can actually be used for cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, for mental illness or for guiding individuals to, to improve their concordance with treatment and also with certain behaviors in relation to asthma. So very exciting developments in relation to highly precise health interventions, not just medicines. A third area, and there are others, um, the third area in relation to precision health uses network theory. Again, in relation to the characteristics of networks in relation to induction, where a change in the behavior of one individual can have an effect on other members of the network, and we have evidence for this, for example, for obesity and for others, or homophily, how groups in a network behave in a certain way. The term we use in English is the birds uh, of a flock um, sort of move together. And then, or confounding, for example, individuals doing exercise and then others join because this is what everybody else is doing. So one can use these principles to develop social network interventions, again, using social media. Um, for example, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and other social media with which you are much more familiar, I'm sure, than, than I am, although I'm quite an um, active user of these technologies. But this is part and parcel of, as students, um, this is part and parcel of what you do. Um, I, I have three children. My elder daughter is 23, my son is 21, and my younger daughter is uh, uh, 19. So one is finished Imperial College, the, my son is at King's, and my younger daughter is at uh, Oxford. And uh, when I say I'm going to send you an email, they say, email, no, no, no. So why don't you just use WhatsApp or some other technology? So they don't really use emails as a means of communication. But with WhatsApp and others, they're very quick to respond. So one can use technological developments and changes in sociocultural norms and behavior to apply theories to change behavior. So very, very exciting. So how can we put all of this together? Is this happening? Well, let's take a, a, one of the largest problems that we face uh, as, as societies beyond climate change, of course, which is a, a real crisis. Obesity is another big problem that, that is affecting all countries in the world. Um, so, but obesity is very complex. There are many, many, many factors that influence obesity. And there was the, 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 the foresight uh, study from the UK that looked at uh, all the factors, and this is a very uh, complex soft systems map that maps it, um, but one can group these factors and their interrelationships into a number of domains. So there are the biology of the individual, then there's behavior in relation to food consumption, or their behavior in relation to individual activity. Uh, but also individual psychology influences those behaviors. Um, but then individual activity is in turn influenced by the environment, the built environment uh, that one is able to have access to, to exercise. But there are also societal influences on the individual, but also food production and what is produced also influences uh, one, what the intake also one's behavior. So one can then design a set of interventions that is multifaceted, that uses uh, many of those principles that I mentioned to influence individuals. And there's a very interesting example from Singapore, where the Singaporean government that has identified obesity as a, a major problem has designed a nationwide uh, 
program that brings together uh, the technological developments as well as some of the developments I've discussed with you in relation to behavioral economics, psychology, classical economics in relation to incentives, as well as networks, um, to design a program called Lose to Win. So losing weight to win um, sort of prizes and, 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 and points. So here, um, individuals are able to get a download an app which tells them, which brings together their lab results, what their treatment they're on, how they exercise, what they eat. They also are given a wearable, a Fitbit, then their data are collected, and they're encouraged to join exercise programs for which they earn a number of health points. They, they actually have free exercise sessions. And, and then if they fit, if they reach their targets, and we see targets as a behavioral intervention, um, if there's an improvement, one is able to get larger number of points, um, fairly large number of points, which they can use for shopping and for other uh, endeavors. Or in, in a, uh, regularly, there is a, a grand draw for, for someone to, to, um, to, to, give, uh, to, to get a, a, a grand prize, which again attracts people uh, because there's a big prize at the end. So here we're seeing a very... I wouldn't call it experiment, it's not beyond, a demonstration of how these principles from science can be used to, to be applied at population level for precision health, but at individual level, using data to inform uh, interventions at individual level uh, over time. This is where the exciting developments are going to come from. I work with the Malaysian government, I had the privilege of working with the government for about uh, five years to analyze the Malaysian health system and to design a health system uh, reform program where we identified the challenges faced by the Malaysian uh, government. And one of these was uh, cardiovascular disease, high levels of obesity, diabetes and hypertension, which are poorly diagnosed and managed. And here we designed a program that uses many of the principles I talked about, um, where the population is stratified using um, a risk profiling instrument based on the kind of study I showed you in India to identify mean cardiovascular risk levels. So they're stratified into low, medium, and high risk. So if somebody's low risk, so they get a customized notification using uh, mobile technologies, uh, and they are nudged to do uh, activities to improve their health and well-being, and they have an annual risk profiling to see if the risk levels have changed. If somebody is a medium risk, they again have a customized notification, they go and have customized screening with more, more tests and more analyses, and then depending on their level, they're referred to primary care level, or those who are at the lower end of risk, they have annual risk profiling to see how they're progressing. Those who are high risk, um, they enter an integrated care pathway, which is carefully designed from uh, prevention to diagnosis to, to uh, treatment and follow-up. And, and again, continue to have uh, annual risk profiling. So those, so highly stratified and highly personalized interventions. So those high, high risk enter a integrated care pathway Again, initially these were developed on paper, but now they're being developed in digital form, so all the data will be captured and can be used to see the effect on the population that we are intervening, but also for the country as a whole, as the intervention scaled up. So individual enters sort of a screening, then there's the confirmation of diagnosis with a set of tests, all evidence-based. Then those who are uh, pre-hypertensive, have certain interventions. Those who are uh, low to medium high risk, they, they enter into a, a, a slightly different program uh, and they're followed up on a regular basis with treatment and lifestyle interventions. And those who are high risk, they also have a concomitant disease, are then referred to secondary care level, to hospitals, and they have additional set of tests to see what their risks are in relation to not just cardiovascular disease, but beyond. So highly stratified approaches 
This is being uh, scaled up in, uh, in several states now in, um, in Malaysia and, and will hopefully become nationwide. Interestingly, even we designed the, uh, the program with one government, but even though the government had changed, they continued with this intervention because it's so important for the country as a whole. But there are other examples of this currently being used. For example, in Spain and also in Italy. In Spain, in Catalonia, and also in the Basque Country, and in Italy, in Veneto region, and in Lombardy region in the north, where um, the principles of risk stratification are used for case finding, identifying high-risk individuals, um, and, preventing, uh, and presenting them with targeted integrated care interventions with, and also personalized case management um, uh, for individuals that have multiple chronic conditions uh, or complex chronic conditions that we call multimorbidity. So these are being applied uh, and in, in several settings. But there are challenges, of course. And I think one of the big challenges is that although we have the science, we've not been able to scale it up rapidly enough to address the challenges to realize the opportunities. One is the heterogeneity. Although we have um, some um, homogeneity at, phenotype, uh, at genotype level, because of all the other factors that I talked about, there is heterogeneity at phenotype level, at individual level, even with similar genetic makeup, except for very narrow genetic mutations. Data. There are lots of data, but data are not integrated. They're not usable, or they're not analyzed. Biomarkers are still being developed, but not all biomarkers are available. Evidence on outcomes. Um, we don't have large enough patient cohorts to look at long-term effects of these interventions. <coughs> there are issues in relation to regulation and pricing but big challenge in relation to health systems, which I will spend a couple of minutes of. And I think this is probably the biggest challenge to scale up of precision medicine and precision health. Because in health systems, the first challenge is we have delivery of lots of innovations, as we talked about. So for example, cancer immunotherapy, big data, analytics, machine learning, AI. We have lab on a chip. Um, very interesting developments. In fact, that one chip was something that uh, Donald, when we were at Imperial College, had, had developed. Um, so many innovations coming through. But there's very little innovation on the delivery of care. So health systems is where 21st century innovation meets uh, ancient history. Many delivery models are still centuries old. So this is the oldest hospital in the world. <coughs> it's actually in France, and it was established in 651, 7th century. It's not a typo. It's still functioning as a hospital. So we have structures that go back centuries, and we have very similar delivery models that are completely not for fit for purpose. Of course, we need hospitals, but the world has changed, certainly since the 7th century but we've been stuck with structures and formations that reflect the past rather than the future. So in order to scale up innovations, we need to change the health system, completely redesign the health systems to enable uptake and diffusion of innovations. So if we look at, when I say health systems are not functioning well, we can demonstrate this. So this is a study published, we published in The Lancet uh, last year uh, that looks in 44 countries using national representative samples, individual level data with biomarkers. Again, this is a sample of more than a million people, um, largest study of its kind in the world. We looked at how hypertension is managed. We also looked at diabetes. So, and we can here look at how different regions of the world are managing hypertension. And we can look at the care cascade, not just the prevalence, but how the condition is managed at each stage. So in Latin America, for example, for every 100 individuals that have high blood pressure, many of them are, uh, have their blood pressure measured, but many, only 50% are diagnosed. And around 40% are put on treatment, but just 
25 or just 25 percent are controlled. Hypertension is very common, very common, but very poorly managed. Many of these countries are upper middle income countries. In Europe and Eastern Mediterranean, similar picture. Um, again, the screening works relatively well, but the health system is uh, not functioning as well as it should. Here, the control levels are 15%. In Southeast Asia, that includes China and, and India, but as well as countries with large populations such as the Philippines and Indonesia, Vietnam, um, um, control levels less than 40% are diagnosed, only 20% treated, and just 10% are controlled. Similar picture in sub-Saharan Africa, where the control levels are even more. So on the one hand, we have remarkable innovations coming through. On the other hand, we have health system that cannot even manage the commonest chronic disease, which is hypertension. And these are completely unacceptable. If in any business, an individual per individual's performance level was then 10%, I don't think that individual will, would stay in their job for very long. But health systems continue have continued to underperform for many centuries and unfortunately continue to do so. Uh, so this is a very big barrier. So what do we do? Um, I won't talk about this because I've met, covered it before. Um, the second innovation challenge is the institutional logic that needs to change, which is probably the most challenging. And you'll recognize this gentleman. Yes? Good, I'm glad because we're at KAUST, it's a science and technology university. Um, so Einstein said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. Um, so in health systems, we're doing the same things over centuries, expecting better results, but we're not getting the results. So we need to change. But this, uh, Einstein said something even better. He also said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use when we created them. So we, can use, we cannot use the thinking that we use when designing health systems, but also when designing interventions, because they're not going to lead to the, res, uh, the desired results. This is where I think work at KAUS can be very exciting to have a multidisciplinary approach working with individuals in health systems, in digital health, computational biology, to, to bring data together from uh, molecular genetic level to uh, physiology uh, at, at phenotype level, but also population level data, and apply analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence to come up with new solutions, then design the health system and care delivery modalities using some of the other approaches I, I talked about from behavioral economics, psychology, as well as network theory and beyond, to have highly precise interventions to maintain health, improve health, but also to provide highly targeted, precise treatments. So how do we create such an ecosystem? Well, the first and foremost is we need the data and the intelligence to be able to identify where the challenges lie and where we have to intervene. So here one can combine data from genomic level to cell, proteomic, cell, organ system and organism level with data at, on the delivery side, healthcare delivery side from home, community, primary care, hospitals, at every step of the care continuum, then bring this together into an integrated big data set, um, then use data mining and analytic approaches with process automation because these data tend to be very large um, to identify uh, patterns, identify where the challenges lie to design interventions. But one can go beyond because one can then actually use computational methods to develop decision support systems, becoming more and more granular in what is being analyzed using risk profiling and stratification as I've shown you in the case of India but also in the case of Malaysia and what is being done in Italy and Spain. But one could take this a stage further and bring into this artificial intelligence and machine learning to develop a, a dynamic and interactive care process that uses critical pathways, 
uh, that, that is initially designed for subgroups but then becomes highly personalized um, to improve effectiveness of care delivered. Um, but because we are improving the efficiency of the care delivered, and this is highly personalized, we also improve resource optimization, which is important because around one-third of healthcare expenditures are wasted. In the U.S., that's a trillion dollars a year, and globally around three trillion dollars a year, every year. So there's an incredible opportunity with precision medicine and precision health to improve not just effectiveness of care, to have better outcomes, but also responsiveness to needs of the users, but also efficiency of care to have benefits beyond health, to help uh, improvements, in, uh, uh, improvements in the economy and help sustain economic growth. So how do we do that? There are many countries actually developing precision medicine strategically, US, UK, and France through genomic uh, medicine 2025 initiative in Genomics England and the Precision, Precision Medicine Initiative in the US. That's, and they're bringing together multidisciplinary groups, ranging from biobanks to healthcare providers, strong involvement of uh, users and patients and populations, new technologies in relation to genomics, uh, communication technologies but also data and analytics to develop integrated solutions for individuals, but also subgroups and populations. Similar initiatives in the UK that brings together uh, the major research uh, organizations, but also the delivery side, the national health system. Similarly in France, uh, major investments in sequencing, in data analytics, but also a very interesting uh, focus of the French initiatives on ethics of these new interventions. Um, so how can we do that? Well, how can we create this ecosystem um, going forward, learning from these examples? And this is my last slide. So what we need is we need um, collaboration across multiple sectors. We need universities to produce the science and the technology and the innovations, but we need the industry that can take this innovation and translate them to use in, in, um, at patient level uh, and, and, and to develop appropriate interventions. But we also need the provider system. We need the health system so that what is being developed can be applied at, at community primary care level, hospitals and beyond, so they can be scaled up to have population level in, impact so that the innovations are not just produced, but they can be delivered in the system to have impact on individuals to improve health, to improve their economic well-being, and to ensure that the countries uh, uh, continue to sustain their economic growth and achieve their societal objectives. So precision medicine and precision health offer great opportunities, and as an institution at CAS, you have much to contribute. Thank you very much for your attention. So, let's look at the future. Can I have my last, can I have a slide, please? So, in the future, there will be one health program. Yours. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Do we have some questions? We have a question at the back there. Oh, that's a good idea. Hello. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I, even though I'm not doing like medicine, and it's possible we can get the slide uh, 15? 15. Because uh, I have two questions about that slide. Is it possible to get slide 15? One, five. Can go to one five. Uh, oh, sorry about.
I'm glad it's not slide one. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be here all day. <laughs> Sorry, okay. guys. Yeah, that's okay. Oh. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, according to this uh, uh, figure, so uh, my first question is how do you calculate the, the mean of 10 years uh, CVD uh, risk for like poor people or rich people? Because you should consider like, education. Like household, uh, like okay, sure. the wealth and like walking. So fortunately, we have, we have some cohort studies that look at uh, cohort uh, of a population and individuals with certain risk levels and, and see outcomes in those individuals in relation to cardiovascular events such as a stroke and uh, or heart attacks. So the score we used here is is actually the Framingham risk score that was developed by colleagues at Harvard and still being used. But there are also other approaches, and we use these data to use different risk scores to see what cardiovascular risk levels were in different settings. So, these, so one could develop a core study here as well to see how, because of the heterogeneity in different countries and individuals, how risk levels may vary at individual level, taking into account characteristics, but also how these may relate to outcomes in the future. So there, there are well-established uh, uh, methods in epidemiology that one can see how certain levels of risk to, can be used to predict certain levels level of cardiovascular events later in, in life. Uh, 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 okay, so my second question is like, uh, uh, because in this trend it shows like the, the poor people like face a, a, a lower risk of CUD, right? So at, at the moment. Uh -huh. At the moment, oh, oh okay, no. So my question is like, uh, because I, I also saw a news, uh, it said the poor people face a greater uh, <laughs> risk of uh, like CVD because they get less sleep. So how do you think the rich people? So, so the risk, yeah. dif different countries, as you go through, again, we're dealing with dynamic uh, events. These are not, Populations are not static, nor are the risk factors. They change. So initially, as countries undergo the epidemiological transition and chronic disease develops, initially the richest population that change their nutritional habits and exercise, etc., they have higher risk. But over time, mm -hmm. they tend to uh, adopt uh -huh. behaviors that reduce their risk, but in the poorest, poorer groups, their risk levels rises because they tend to use high-calorie, low nutrition foods. And we are seeing this happening in Mexico, also in Brazil. So this trend that we're observing in India at the moment, uh, which is early in transition, will change if India follows the same pattern as other countries. Oh, so this dynamic. Dynamic oh, is okay, very important. Okay, okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much. Sure. Okay. I'm very conscious of time. So um, I'd like, before we close, just to Thank Rifat. We have a small token of our gratitude. Oh, thank you. To thank Rifat for a wonderful exposition of what precision medicine and precision health can do. And also, I think, for giving us all a wonderful challenge. So all of the ways that we can think about using our science and technology to try and address some of these very critical issues. So thank you, Rifat. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.